Hello folks, Dale Piper here again. And uh, I'm smoking my mortar, which I introduced in the last video. And in it, I have um, a rather interesting tobacco, or a tobacco with a, a good history to it. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the man behind it. His name was Walter Clopton Wingfield. He was um, very much a Victorian gentleman, um, a soldier, uh, a courtier, and um, an inventor, and uh, also a good cook. Walter was born in Wales uh, to a wealthy, well-to-do family in 1833. 1833 was right in the middle of the reign of King, King William IV. He was the king before Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria came to the throne in 1837. So uh, Walter would, be, would have been four when she became queen, the young queen at the age of 18. So Walter was born in 1833 and um, brought up in Wales. Unfortunately, his mother died uh, when he was only three years old and his father died when he was 13. So he was kind of orphaned um, in his um, childhood and early teenage years. Uh, his uncle took care of him and uh, sent him off to school, to boarding school, as uh, was the fate of most um, young gentlemen at that stage in um, our history. And he went to a school called Russell School, which actually is about four miles down the road from where I live. It's, uh, it's an old um, boarding school. And he was educated there. Um, and um, when, he came, when he left school, of course, um, usually gentlemen of that time, if they didn't inherit the estate and go to work on the, the family estate, which they owned in Wales, uh, the second sons or juniors tended to be either to go into the um, army or to go into the church. Well, he chose to go into the army and um, he was commissioned into the Dragoon Guards. He um, was probably shown a bit of favouritism because his, his uncle was a colonel in the Dragoon Guards. And uh, pretty soon he was sent off to India where he served. Um, in the English army, in the British army, um, he saw, he, he fairly quickly became a captain, obviously with strong family influence, um, and he saw active service in China in um, the 1850s in what were called the Second Opium Wars, which we um, took on China. Anyhow, his military career came to an end after his Chinese uh, wars, and in 1862 he retired from the army, and um, he went back to his um, country estate in uh, Denbyshire in Wales, um, where he became involved or got involved in the local community. He became a magistrate, justice of the peace, and um, he uh, also then enlisted into the Montgomery Yeomanry and uh, was quickly um, promoted in that and to, up to the because he was an experienced soldier and he soon attained the rank of major in the um, Yeomanry, Montgomeryshire Yeomanry. Um, at that point he moves to London and um, he becomes involved in the court of um, Queen Victoria where he becomes a, um, a member of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen-at-Arms, which is a kind of um, ceremonial role. So he would take a prominent part in um, parades and um, around court at 
celebrations and uh, all official ceremonies and things like that. He would be uniformed up and, and he would uh, take an active role. And he seems to be highly regarded by the, the royal family. Um, he was decorated by Queen Victoria with um, some honours and, um, and also by her son, King Edward, who became King Edward the Seventh. He, he gave him um, distinguished orders as well. Uh, it's around about this time that he becomes involved with the game of lawn tennis, which uh, you may think is a strange um, thing for this soldier to be, to be involved in. But it was all made possible by the development of vulcanised rubber in Germany. And the fact that bouncing balls became possible, and with it, the concept of being able to project these over a net with a bat or a racket and um, play the game of tennis. And he invented a game suitable for playing on lawned areas because a lot of, um, a lot of the um, aristocrats had um, areas for um, croquet and things which they had specially prepared in their estate. So it's quite easy to convert a, co a croquet lawn into a tennis court. And um, he actually invented a, um, a game involving a tennis ball, a racket, and a set of rules and the nets that he needed. And he packaged all this up and he called it um, Pharisteiki, which is a kind of weird corruption from the Greek, um, meaning literally... Um, game of tennis and uh, he marketed it um, he he got a firm to make them for him and um, these Sparastaiki sets uh, became on sale in London and uh, they sold rather well in a short period of time he'd sold well over a thousand of them they mainly went to people as I say who had land and country houses and things like that and who had a ready-made court which they could uh, play the game on. Um, and the next thing is that this game gets taken up by Marleybone Cricket Club, the MCC, and they start and adopt it. And um, it's, you know, it's then um, kind of takes off. Um, he, unfortunately, um, didn't have the best of... Um, happiness in marriage because his his wife suffered from mental illness and um, was um, very ill I think and, and um, ended up she she lived longer than him and she ended up in an asylum um, which was a personal tragedy for him but um, having got uh, having launched uh, lawn tennis he then um, got himself involved in another one of his hobbies, which was cooking. And he founded a cookery um, order called uh, Le Cordon Rouge. Um, and this became quite an exclusive um, uh, arrangement for people to join aspiring cooks. And um, he developed this cookery course involving that. He also experimented with bicycles. And he developed a bicycle that... Um, where two or three riders could, um, the, the bikes were joined together, and two or three riders riding abreast could um, ride these bicycles uh, at one time together, all at once. And um, he uh, arranged for martial music, military music, to be played whilst they rode these bikes around. He's quite a cookie character, I believe. Anyhow, he... Um, um, was decorated, as I say, by um, Edward VII um, for personal services to the sovereign and the royal family. And he died in 1912 at the age of 78. And he's, uh, as you wander around London, you may notice that some buildings have these funny circular blue plaques and they denote people who have lived in the houses who were famous in the past. And... Um, if you go to, um, I think it's um, um, Belgrave Court, 
I need to check up on that. But here we are. That is uh, Walter Clopton Wingfield's plaque on the wall of his house where he lived, uh, which calls him the father of lawn tennis. I have some images, some other images of him. Um, here he is in military uniform. Fine, upstanding um, Victorian soldier. And um, dressed as a Victorian gentleman with his top hat and fur collared coat. And here's a younger one of him as the young adventurer going off to, um, to India. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Good question. And there is a connection because he also has a link to pipe smoking. I mentioned some in, in another video, um, JJ Fox's in um, St. James's. And um, JJ Fox's used to be Robert Lewis, the oldest tobacconist, I think, in London when it was established there in 1787. Walter Wingfield was a customer of Robert Lewis. And um, because he became a celebrity, he was like almost an early cult of personality. Um, and he acquired celebrity status uh, around London. And so um, Robert Lewis used to supply his tobacco to him. And he said to them, you can use my name if you want on the on your tobacco and in return i i'll have a pound of tobacco sent to my london address every month as a fee so he charged them and that led to the establishment of robert lewis's wingfield mixture which used to get a pound off free every month to his address now let me show it to you there we are at this point I usually yeah tip it all over the place now the reason I know that he got this tobacco delivered to him is because um, J.J. Fox's have a museum of the old um, customers and so forth that uh, were famous people who um, bought from Robert Lewis in their day. And uh, in their ledgers, if you go into their ledgers, you'll find the entry for um, a Wingfield Mixture. And the actual entry reads... On the first day of each succeeding month, a packet of the said mixture to the weight of one pound to be delivered to the said Walter Wingfield, free of expense, to an address in London to be specified. And that's an actual quote from Robert Lewis's ledgers. Well, what is it? Well, it's described as a blend of fine Virginias sun-cured orientals and dark leaves which had been cooked into a flake before being broken down. It's described as cool burning and of true English complexity. Uh, tobacco reviews say it's a very cool smoke with an outstanding taste. So what do I make to it? Well, I've actually got quite a bit of it in my cellar because I rather like it. Sorry, I'm picking up the bits from my desk. Spilt some when I showed it to you. It's a sipping tobacco, I call it. I think um, because it's quite light and because it's very easy to smoke, I think it could possibly burn your tongue, but I'm not a great fan of burnt tongue, so I sip it slowly.
because I think if you chugged on it like a, an old diesel engine in a banana boat, then you would get tongue bite from it. But if you sip it, and just let it drift over your palate. It has, like a summer breeze, it always has a whiff of the tennis court about it, with a honey fragrance. Probably best enjoyed with a good cup of English tea Drunk, of course, from a china cup. And with it, you would be transported to the Major's study. The French doors open onto a freshly mowed lawn with a tennis court on it. And in the background, you'd hear the gentle thwack of a tennis ball on a strung racket. And a quiet chair as somebody scored a point. Quintessentially English. And in my opinion, a lovely smoke. Robert Lewis, Wingfield Mixture. Well, that's all. Have a good weekend, folks. All the best from Dale Piper. Bye for now.